Good morning and welcome to chapter 13 on motivation. I'm going to try to keep this uh, chapter uh, under an hour. It's pretty straightforward. For some of you, it's going to be review. Uh, there's a little bit of psychology in there. In fact, there's a lot of it. Um, and so the people who took psychology will recognize some of the, some of the things there. Um, but uh, remember that this is applied to business. And so a lot of it has to do with just motivation in the, in the field of any area of management. So I'll just uh, go ahead and get started on chapter 13 now. Um, so what is motivation and what affects motivation, right? So if you think about um, this semester in this class in management, think about um, what class looked like at the beginning of the semester and what it looks like now. I think about, um, you know, during office hours on, on Friday when I have the 9 a.m. office hours open for everyone, uh, you know, maybe who shows up, think about, uh, in your groups, you know, you, we have these group projects, how many students are still engaged, right? And, you know, yes, things happen. Some people maybe uh, ended up having to work more, uh, but, but sometimes a lot of it is just motivation as well. Um, just not being motivated to finish a class, not being motivated to do the work, not being motivated to start a project on time. There's all kinds of factors. Uh, on a personal level, when I was uh, an undergrad, um, I took this pretty brutal uh, business law class. We had this West's business law, which I still have, book. Uh, and, um, and it was just, just uh, you know, brute memorization of uh, terms and rules of law. We had to come to class ready to have memorized all these rules of law. And, and, and he, the instructor would, would pick our names uh, randomly. And I just really did not look forward to that class only because uh, it was a very, uh, the class itself was uh, not very positive. The instructor uh, believed in uh, negative reinforcement for sure. And I remember posting in, in my bedroom above my desk, a big flashcard with just the words motivation or motivate. It was motivate with an exclamation mark. And it was my, remind, my re rem reminder to myself when I got to my room, that even though I'd be tempted to just hang out with my roommates or, um, you know, just veg or go run or go swim or anything, but study, it was my, my reminder to, um, to study. And it worked because I'd come to my room and I would think like, oh, I'm exhausted, long day, work, school, everything. And I would see that and we, it, would, it would be my reminder that, oh, I do not want to be that student tomorrow uh, who's not going to know the, the rule of law. Uh, and so, you know, the direction, the persistence and initiation are all of those things that are going to shape motivation. And uh, we'll talk about them as we go. So what are the basics? There's effort and performance, right? Um, you know, a lot of times uh, when you hear things like, uh, I'm going to work really, really hard. Uh, I'm going to study really, really hard. That's great. But sometimes I, I ask, uh, are you studying smart? What does that mean? Well, did you look at the results of your first exam? Did, you, did we meet during office hours? Did, did we see what you missed and, and why you missed those questions? And by virtue of you understanding what you missed, you can better study for the second one, right? This is kind of like part of the PDCA cycles we talked about before. And so for me, effort and performance kind of go hand in hand in terms of making sure you do things the smart way. The extrinsic and intrinsic reward, we'll talk about that. Uh, you know, the, the, how you feel inside about your work versus, you know, uh, what the externalities are about your, your work. Need satisfaction and then motivate people as well. So effort, initiation, direction, and persistence, all of these three things are gonna affect performance. Uh, what is job performance? Uh, it's these three things together, right? Motivation, ability, and situational constraint. You'll see a couple of formulas throughout. So job performance, how well someone performs the job, motivation, the effort put in the job, the capability to do the job, and what are the constraints, the factors affecting performance. Uh, we could apply that to your group project right now. If you, if you were to think about how your group has performed and um, for your task, for your analysis, uh, with all the companies we had, Sony, Costco, Toyota, Disney, Caterpillar, and Spirit, uh, airways, um, think about your group in, in terms of the, the job performance, you know, uh, the contribution, and that's why I'm a peer evaluation. This is how everything is kind of outlined. 
what's the motivation uh, from group members? Are some group members that have been showing more motivation than others? And what about the ability? Sometimes people overpromise, under deliver, right? Oh, it's, I'm, I'm really good at this. I'm going to do an awesome job. And you realize, what? What happened? And so ability, uh, and that's why at the very beginning of the semester in the rubric that I have group members fill out, I'm asking group members to outline their, um, their strengths, right? And of course, what are the situational concerns, external factors affecting performance? Well, we have one. It's called COVID-19, <laughs> you know, now that we're doing everything through Zoom, uh, and we had to, in, you know, this is a historic semester for sure, where we switched over from a face-to-face -face format environment to online learning uh, for everybody, right? And so, yes, there's been a lot of constraints. Some students have decided to take that emergency withdrawal grade uh, with admin uh, because they've decided, no, not, that's not what I signed up for. I'm not doing it. Uh, and, and so for those of you who are sticking it out, you know, I, 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 really congratulations because I know it's not been easy for everybody and a lot of students have decided I'm going to try this again in the future. Um, so that's for that. Need satisfaction. So needs are the physical, physiological requirements must be not met to ensure survivals and well-being. Very basic stuff. Here you're thinking about, you know, water. You can't survive without water very long, right? Uh, you can survive longer uh, without food than you can survive without water. And so think about those needs. And this is where we'll talk a little bit about Maslow, Oliver. We'll talk about the, the higher and the lower level needs. Uh, and so the unmet needs motivate people. And so the idea here is that um, if you think about um, where your stage is in life, and if you think about, especially when you're a college student and you're struggling and it's no fun and you have these crappy jobs and you're not getting paid well, and you're, you're really thinking, you're, you see it and you're thinking, the education is my way out, um, my degree, hopefully it's the kind of degree that will pay the bills or more. And so you're going to be motivated to move forward with that. Uh, and so here we have the three approaches to motivation. We'll talk about Maslow, Alderfer, and McClellan. I'm not going to do as much on McClellan. Uh, basically, when you think about Maslow, uh, you can, well, anyway, well, I'll, I'll just show you, you can split things. So here's, here's what I added. I kind of transformed some of the slides. On the left, you recognize this probably for a lot of other classes, sociology, psychology, advertising, marketing. I mean, this is going to show up everywhere. So Ibram Maslow came up with this uh, hierarchy of needs on the left, right? Alderfer has an ERG theory here on the right. And what, what, what's being done here is a comparison of the two. Um, you can split Maslow's hierarchy of needs from bottom to top. And so when you look at Maslow's physiological needs at the bottom, it's food, wa uh, food water, shelter, uh, you know, very, very basic needs. I think we even covered this in my business 10 class, actually. And then you're getting, sorry, uh, shelters, number two, safety needs. Uh, once you've met those two, then the idea is then you can go on to the next level with it, which is the social and belongingness need. And then finally, the esteem need. And finally, the self-actualization with the idea that few people will, will get to the self-actualization because they're too busy trying to meet other needs. Um, if, you, um, if you work for a company and they're trying to get you to be more of a team player and they want you to share your knowledge with the other group members, and say, you know, team members, etc., but they're not giving you dental and they're not giving you a vision insurance, right? And you have kids and you have kids with uh, cavities, right? It's going to be hard for you to feel like a team player when you're worried about where you're going to get 1500 bucks to pay a dentist for your kid's teeth. And so it's just kind of how it works, right? You, you have you know, the idea is you start from the bottom, you work your way up. This is a theory. It's not a law. Uh, people typically use the example of Anne Frank, who did meet any of those needs, and yet she was self-actualizing, right, at the very, very top with, with her book, memoir, her journal. Uh, and then Alderfer on the right, you basically, what you, what you have here is his growth needs, right? So if we start with his ERG, so E stands for existence needs, safety and physiological meet the existence needs, relatedness is the social and belongingness, and the esteem in the self is the growth, that's why it's called the ERG. And so again, it's the same concept. Uh, and then we have McClellan uh, with power, achievement, affiliation, which is all higher order needs. 
So those three names, just memorize them, know who they are, what they did. Maslow is going to show up again in probably so many classes. Uh, intrinsic versus extrinsic reward. Um, well, this is, uh, if you think about, um, I'll, I'll use the example of accounting. Uh, we have, uh, um, it's, always, it's always very difficult in my department to find someone to teach accounting full time. It's very difficult. Uh, when we go out to recruit people, uh, I'll give you a comparison. I was uh, on a committee not too long ago uh, for another department outside of business. And it's the kind of situation where lots and lots and lots of people have that kind of degree. Over 300 applicants applied for the job, right? And so that's just a bear. You, and, and, and those are the people, by the way, whose resumes uh, were, were you know, sent through. There were even more people who maybe forgot to attach their transcripts and their file was not sent through. So for sure, more than 300 people applied. Um, accounting. <laughs> since I've been at Chafee in the last 20 years, uh, there's been accounting uh, hiring committees where we only had eight people apply for the job. And, uh, and this is full-time tenure track, right? It's the same as the other one for 300, same pay. And what's happening with accounting, for example, is that you have a lot of people who are just making a lot more money uh, in their profession as an accountant. And they don't want to give that up to teach because in the beginning, when you first start teaching, it's you take a pick up for sure. So who's going to want to be an accounting professor, right? Well, the question becomes, what are they motivated by? What's, motiv what's motivating them? And if you're an accountant, but you're, and you're doing really well, but you're working 80 hour weeks, and you never see your kids, you don't see your family, you don't go on vacation, you have no weekends, you're just a working machine. There, there comes a time where you think about quality of life and the rewards that come from within also with the career. And when you're, you know, teaching is special. Teaching is, is really special because you get, it's, it's gratifying when you've been doing it long enough and you hear back from former students who've done exceedingly well uh, and let you know um, and then recognize the education. So that's an example, for example, of an intrinsic reward, right? What, how you feel about the job. And I, I for speaking for myself and I know I can, I can, you know, uh, speak on the behalf of uh, my colleagues, Abel Chan, Dave Carr, uh, Carr Nelson, and Carol Dickerson. Uh, I can say that um, all of us uh, feel a very strong natural reward with, with teaching. Look forward to coming to work, or in this case, coming to my office at home. Um, the, uh, it's associated with performing the task for its own sake. The extrinsic reward is the tangible, visible to other uh, thing, right? So it's the, uh, you know, the pay is an extrinsic reward. Maybe the title that comes with it, the uh, status, that's an extrinsic reward. The company car, the preferred parking, whatever you want. Those are all extrinsic reward. Uh, and so you want a job that gives you both, obviously. That's the ideal. You want one that gives you the extrinsic and the intrinsic. Some jobs are weak on extrinsic, strong intrinsic. I've talked to former students who uh, were uh, um, uh, in uh, EMTs, they were EMTs, emergency, emergency medical technicians. And they said that they hated the work because of the hours, right? The hours were tough. They didn't get paid well at all. Many were doing it as a stepping stone to become uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, firefighters. But they all said the same thing. They, they, it, there is that intrinsic feeling that they got uh, that boosted them from saving a life. You know, that just really, the work itself was meaningful, but extrinsically was not rewarding. Uh, okay, so again, uh, people join the extrinsic rewards. People the, might explain why someone might join an organization. Uh, when I worked in the computer industry, it was interesting. A lot of people who I met worked for Microsoft in sales. Uh, their cars, I was so surprised the first time I met a couple of them. This is back in the 90s. But they drove these really cheap cars. And I worked with people in other companies who drove really nice cars. And I remember finding out that uh, people who worked at Microsoft, initially, the reward was pretty weak, uh, the extrinsic reward. Uh, but, uh, you know, they had to work their way up, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so, and so other companies realized we can attract talent by just throwing them more money than Microsoft. They regularly attend their jobs, they perform their jobs well, and they stay within the organization. One of the best ways of uh, you know, looking at intrinsic and extrinsic reward being a strong factor is turnover. If there's no turnover and people stay with the company, you're doing something right. Uh, the intrinsic, okay, there we go. The sense of accomplishment, feeling of responsibility, the chance to learn something new, fun that comes with performing an interesting, challenging, and engaging task. So the ideal again here is to find the kind of environment that um, has all of the above, right? Uh, so again, the most important in extrinsic reward, good benefits, health insurance, job security, vacation time. We talked about that. And for intrinsic work, there we go, learning new skill, interesting work, independent work situation. Um, you know, again, what, what I love about teaching is that um, our, 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 um, our employer, Chiefy College, or the state of California, uh, really is good about um, uh, allowing us, if we find a, a venue that, that we are interested in and we want to learn more about some new topic, uh, we, we can go and, uh, to some conference or something and learn uh, what the latest is, right? So uh, that's, been, that's, that's really very rewarding. Uh, so how do you add reward to the model? So if we look at this model over here, unsatisfied need, that creates tension, and the tension energizes you to take action, and that creates effort, you initiate, you direct, you persist, and then the performance leading to the intrinsic extrinsic reward, and that hopefully leads to satisfaction. Uh, you know, this is obviously a model that's specific to work and to management, but in terms of that model, I've, I've heard used it uh, you, uh, people use it before as an example for someone, you know, let's say, uh, you know, Becky is a student and her car broke down. So she's got an unsatisfied need. She's got no car. Uh, so that creates tension. How am I going to get to school? How am I going to get to work? So for a while, she'll be, you know, using Uber, calling friends, whatever, borrowing parents' cars, but it's going to energize her to take action. That's going to create this effort of initiation, direction, and persistence. She's going to do research. She's going to find out what kind of what what's the stuff, what models are available out there, et cetera, et cetera. And then the performance, you know, she's going to go to her credit union, go to your credit union uh, to get a loan for a car um, and uh, don't have a bank, have a credit union. I think we talked about that in class. It's my public service announcement. If you have a bank, get a credit union. If you're not sure why, do a simple Google search, banks versus credit union. One is for profit, has to satisfy the needs of the shareholders banks, and the other one is a non-profit organization, credit unions. Uh, credit unions have better rates. Uh, they tend to have, uh, you have uh, once you establish a better relationship with your credit union, you can get more out of them than a bank. Anyway, uh, having said all that, you know, uh, you, you, you get the idea. You can motivate people with the basics, ask people what their needs are. So here's the interesting thing. You know, you've heard people like, oh, I'm a great leader, I'm a great manager, I'm the best, and uh, I just know how to do this thing, and everybody's going to listen to me. That's a problem because everybody has different needs, right? If you have, um, I know that uh, speaking for myself, when I first graduated from college and I worked in the computer industry, I know that my needs then were completely different than my needs today. Why? Because I didn't have any kids, right? So all I wanted was chasing money. I was chasing bonuses. I was trying to go where the money was and working 80 hour weeks, sleeping in my office, no problem. Um, but, um, you know, obviously things, things change. Once you have kids, everything changes. And for example, you're going to be maybe less motivated by a bonus and you might be more motivated by a flexible schedule or maybe some time off when you need it or, you know, I don't know, some, something having to do with, of course, being a parent, uh, being a good parent. So um, you, it's important to ask people what their needs are because you'll find out that your employees might not have the same needs, right? Satisfy the lower order needs first. All right, fine, you've got young kids. Why can't we have our own daycare? This is a big organization, we got thousands of people. And so maybe we need to research that. So let's go through HR, let's talk to the lawyers. Uh, can we partner up with a local uh, place that's you know, where our employees are already going because it's close to here and it's on the way here and see if there's an area in our facility that can accommodate uh, like some kind of a daycare situation. And so now people all of a sudden, uh, not only they're not late to work, they're early, 
But on top of that, they stay. They stay in the building because during their break, they maybe they want to go have lunch with their kids. Um, anyway, just giving you a basic idea. Uh, the insurance, for example, that's probably a better example of, uh, of, of uh, the uh, extrinsic lower order needs, right? Having insurance. Uh, expect people's needs to change. I just talked about that. Satisfy higher order needs by looking for ways to allow employees to experience intrinsic reward. As things progress, people are going to be motivated by, by other things. Um, and so, uh, you know, being in education myself, I'm motivated by learning. I want to learn. And so, um, you know, I, I have heard of, I've heard of colleagues who will decide uh, what, their, um, uh, what their conference is going to be by location. <laughs> So if there's a conference in Hawaii, all of a sudden they want to go to Hawaii to this conference because it's really interesting. Uh, I'm, I guess I just didn't get that memo. And so my conferences sometimes are in LA or they've been in Colorado and then uh, Michigan, uh, but usually tied to something international. And so, um, but again, I'm, I'm very lucky because my employer rewards my, uh, my, my ongoing thirst for knowledge and curiosity in international business and, and, and allows me to do stuff like that. Uh, the equity theory is very, very interesting. So now we're going to kind of phase two of the slides here. And so this is basically where, if you think about the effort you put forth in the work and the expectation of an outcome that you have based on the effort put in, uh, how you feel when you put forth a lot of effort and you don't get the outcome you were expecting, right? Uh, you're, you're demotivated, you, you, uh, it affects you morally. And so this is what this is about, equity theory and things being equitable. Uh, components of equity theory, the reaction to perceived inequity, how people react when they go, well, I did all this much and you, know, you didn't reward me, but you rewarded, again, Becky over here, and uh, motivate people using equity theory. How do you do it? So you've got your input for equity theory, employees' contribution to the organization. Uh, you know, I'm staying after hours, I'm working overtime, I'm doing all the stuff, that's my input. What's the outcome? What's the reward from the organization based on the succeeding output? You're hoping that it commensurate what you're putting in, right? You're hoping that you're being recognized. The referent is, wait a second, uh, I, I, I put in extra time, I put in extra hours, and my colleague over here, who didn't do anything like that, in fact, is a bit flaky and maybe he's dialing it in and not showing up or leaving early, he's getting the same, the same rewards. Uh, so then I'm going to start to look at this and feel like, well, this is, this is not fair, right? This is not equitable. And so there's a ratio of your, in, your outcomes and your inputs. So your outcome over your input compared to the outcome over inputs of others of reference. And they should be the same. And when they're not the same, that's when you got a problem. So inequity, that's the problem, right? When your IO ratio differs from others. So under reward, maybe your IO ratio is greater than, your reference ratio is greater than yours. And then you're gonna be very angry. You're gonna be frustrated. Wait a second. Well, you know, this is when people check out, when they go like, well, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go the extra mile. I'm not gonna do that. Look at, look at this one over here, just not doing anything and, you know, get treated the same. Over reward, maybe you're the one, maybe you're the, you're the pet, maybe you're the, you're the boss's lap dog and you're the one who's been brown nosing and like crazy and you're protected by the boss. And now everybody's going like, what? Are you kidding me? We're doing a million things and this one over here is just dialing it in and is protected and is getting rewarded the same. Why do we care? That's it, I'm just gonna do the minimum. And or, uh, you know, if you're over rewarded, then you might you might experience guilt. Oh my God, you know it's uh, well, I'm getting I'm, I'm doing I'm doing nothing. I'm being you know I'm getting all this reward. This, by the way, happens with nepotism. Think about that one. You know you have an employee who's not related to the family and who's working like crazy, and over here you have the nephew who got the job and who's getting paid twice as much as you and not doing anything. You know then then you know maybe they might feel guilty. They know, like, oh, I don't, I don't deserve this. I'm getting all this pay, and this one over here is doing all the work. I mean, if they have a conscience. Uh, how people react to perceived inequity, they can reduce the input, right? So then this is where your employees, you lose your employees. When you do stuff like that, you, whatever you were 
happy about before with, oh man, I'm such productive team we have here, such great people here. Once you show that kind of inequity or, you know, maybe the nepotism or whatever you want to call it, you, all of that energy, you kill it. You just kill it right away. Um, you can increase the outcome. Uh, you rationalize inputs or outcomes, or you can change the referent. Maybe you do another comparison or you just leave. And that's how you lose very good people, by the way. You lose good people because of this you know, idiotic kind of uh, preferential treatment. Um, so let's see, how do you add equity theory to the model, right? Again, so right between energized to take action and effort, you can re restore equity here by doing the things we talked about. This is where people leave. I've had students tell me horrible, horrible situation. And I tell them like, look, we have a career center at Chiefy College, look it up, work on campus. You know, if you're so unhappy, by the way, the number one killer in the United States is stress, right? So you don't take it lightly. If you're being really, really stressed out by work, especially if you have some kind of compromised health, you're really literally at risk of death. Uh, and so I tell my students, it's life's too short, take a pay cut, be happy, and then just kind of rebuild yourself and then do something else. Uh, and so the intrinsic reward, this is where you have per perceived equity or inequity or the extrinsic reward, right? So how do you motivate with equity theory? You look for and you correct major inequities, right? You better, you better do that. But uh, what if you're the cause of the problem? What, what if you're the one who responds to brown nosers or pets and, and maybe you're blind to it and you think everybody else, you know, you, this is where you really need to make sure you get your feelers out and you have to trust your manager and you have to trust your people and make sure that you have your own kind of internal social audit to know what is truly happening. Uh, you can reduce your employees' input. Maybe, you know, uh, you know, you need to take a break a little bit. Make sure decision-making process are fair. So this is where we go into distributive and procedural justice, right? I'm not going to go into that, so don't worry too much about it. I know this uh, chapter is a bit of a whopper. Uh, so components of expectancy theory and motivating with expectancy theory. So here we go. I tweaked the slice a little bit. Uh, there's three critical things that you want to look at with expectancy theory. So if you look at that picture that I have here, just imagine that um, there's two people involved, right? So you see, let's say that the woman here shaking hands is the boss. She's the manager. And you have these two guys over here and the one who's shaking her hand is the one that got the promotion. And you want the other one, maybe he didn't go for the promotion. He thought, mm, I don't want this promotion. And so first, let's start with balance, right, in terms of the expectancy theory. It's simply the attractiveness or desirability of various rewards and outcome. And one of the real basic example of that is a promotion. Not everybody is going to go for a promotion. Not everybody. Everybody's going to see things in their own paradigm. And so someone might, might be absolutely, I mean, I, I know that at Chafee College, I, I remember I was a trainer for a while for people who just, uh, who just got here. And I remember one time this person who just got here and already was asking questions about being the dean of the department. And I was so perplexed because I thought, I thought you, got, you applied for this job here to be a professor. I thought you, you wanted to educate, you wanted to teach, you're uh, an expert. I didn't realize that you got this job as a way to be, uh, you know, an administrator. And so some people are really just find this really massive appeal of, uh, you know, maybe getting the promotions, if you want to call it that, uh, going into these areas. Um, and so you, everybody's going to be different and everybody's motivated by different things. Not everybody is going to be interested in the promotion. Expectancy is the perceived relationship between your, the effort and the performance, right? So that's the second stage instrument. And that, notice that it's between the effort and the performance, right? And then for instrumentality, now we're talking about the performance and the reward. And these three things go hand in hand. And basically they define motivation. Balance times instrumentality times expectancy is that equation. So expectancy theory holds that people, uh, for people to be highly motivated, these three variables must be high. Right. And again, it, it, you know, if people are not going for your uh, uh, the title for the promotion, maybe you're not rewarding them well for it. Maybe you need to like increase whatever you're paying or maybe 
uh, it's too broad or it's got too much depth or who knows what. So how do you add the expectancy theory to the model? Well, there we go. So balanced instrumentality would be how to energize people to take action, right? And for the persistence, direction, and initiation, that's the expectancy part right there. Uh, increasing expectancy. One way to increase expectancy is to train employees. Clearly here, this employee looks like he needs training. Sorry, I had to. Uh, motivating with expectancy theory. Systematically gather information to find out what employees want from their job. I know I'm being repetitive, but that's basically it, right? What are people looking forward to? In this little graphic, this one's chasing money. Uh, and so, of course, we all are interested in, in, in having more money if we can, right? But there's a cost benefit to it. There, you know, and again, if I give you the example of an accounting professional leaving maybe a more lucrative position for an accounting firm to work in education is because it's more fulfilling for them. It's more fulfilling for them to teach accounting to students than it is to do uh, an audits for a big, you know, for-profit multinational. Um, and uh, um, and so the reward to performance really has to be gauged. Uh, I know that when I worked in the computer industry, um, none of us, my colleagues and I, my my friends and I, none of us were interested in um, wanting to be uh, the uh, sales manager. And, and there were several reasons for that. Uh, many of us made more money in sales than we did as a sales manager, number one. But number two, there's something that was really interesting. That if, if let's say, a lot of times people were, were really to transition to sales manager because something in life, you know, maybe they had kids, maybe uh, they just didn't want to be out all the time uh, or they wanted to reduce the stress. But what was fascinating was this, Many, many companies do this in sales, which is really too, too bad. Um, let's say you have uh, one or two employees on your sales team that are your highest performer, right? These are the ones that are generated the most by bringing in the clients. They're just doing the legwork and they're going out there. Very often, they're the last people you will promote. On the other hand, if we go with the people who are not your best and the people who might not be bringing in your accounts, they tend to get promoted. And the reason is that you have too much to lose when you promote someone who's your cash cow, someone who's bringing in all the cash. And so if you think about all of the stuff we're talking about right now, the expectancy theory and the equity, and um, the, even the respect, you know, it's, it's funny because uh, I, I have many, many friends in the computer industry who never respected their bosses because their bosses used to be their colleague and these people were not able to produce what these guys produced, right? And now they're their boss. And so um, the smart ones would just let their employees go out and do their thing, let their team do it and not interfere. Uh, again, I'm giving you kind of like, I'm trying to apply this to some of the real life scenarios that I've experienced and they're still out there today. Uh, empower employees to make decisions which enhance expectancy perception. Again, you want to make sure you empower them. So now we're getting into the reinforcement theory. What are the components, the schedules for delivering reinforcement and motivate with reinforcement theory. This is where the psychology comes in, classical conditioning, positive, negative reinforcement, stuff like that uh, as applied to management. So the reinforcement theory uh, states that behavior is a function of its consequence. Behavior followed by positive consequence will occur more frequently and behavior followed by negative consequence or not followed by positive consequence will occur less frequently. Um, you know, you get written up at work, you're less likely to do whatever the thing you did. Uh, you get praised, you get, uh, I don't know, bonuses, whatever, you're more likely to continue uh, the behavior. That's basically what that is. Uh, so again, for those of you who remember your psych class, positive, negative, punishment, extension. So positive reinforcement, desirable consequence, strengthen the behavior, negative, withhold unpleasant consequence uh, to strengthen the, the behavior. So that's that's what negative reinforcement is, which a lot of people get confused with punishment. Uh, punishment is the unpleasant consequence to weaken the behavior. So maybe, I don't know, something happened and uh, the HR has decided that you're going to go uh, on unpaid leave for a week so that you can learn whatever it is that you needed to learn. Extension, there's no consequence uh, and it just a weakened, no consequence weakens behavior, neither positive or, or negative. Um, Let's see. 
adding reinforcement to the model. So again, this is under, you know, we added earlier valence instrumentality, et cetera. So here what you've got is that your extrinsic reward is the vehicle that's going to help with your reinforcement contingency. And that's going to apply to effort, instrumentality, and valence, which will uh, help the employee be energized. And those are going to be set through schedules of reinforcement. So how do you administer the schedules for reinforcement? I'm keeping this one kind of a little bit shallow. I'm gonna keep it very straightforward, just as it sounds. Some are gonna be continuous. I know that uh, companies like Edison, for example, have uh, continuous uh, uh, schedules and others are just more intermittent, depending on the company. Uh, motivate with reinforcement theory, identify, measure, analyze, intervene, evaluate. Don't reinforce the wrong behavior. Uh, I took a class one time in college and um, it was a German class. And a very nice professor, very friendly, um, lots and lots of stories, which was fun except for learning German. But what, was, what he did that just drove me up the wall was every time a student came in late, he would stop lecture, he would go up to them and he would say, good morning, alles gut. So he basically engaged with the student who came in late, right? And guess what happened? And by the way, I dropped the class after three weeks because I just realized I was, I was better learning German on my own. Um, what, what, what ended up happening was that the students who wanted that attention, what did they do? They came in late. Or if they were hesitant, oh my God, I, I need to be on time. Maybe they realized, wait a second, I kind of like being greeted. The whole class stops, the whole lecture stops when I come in. That makes me feel special. And it was insane. I remember the last, the last day calculating over 15 minutes was wasted with him interacting with students who came in late. And so again, just don't reinforce the wrong behavior. <laughs> Correctly administer punishment at the appropriate time. Um, you know, there's, I, I, you know, for those of you who have pets, right, and who have dogs, um, you, you, you've learned about some of the do's and don'ts with trying to train your dog. And so there's the, this, this classic thing about, you know, you have a puppy and you come home and the puppy peed. And so the first thing you do is you reprimand the puppy for peeing on the floor. And right away you take him outside and yell at him, no, no, no. And some people like put their, you know, their, 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 their face in the, uh, in the pee, which is horrible. And I remember this, this one trainer explaining like, what's the association? <laughs> the association is every time they hear the key and every time they hear the door open, they think when you come home, they're gonna get it. They just don't know it's because they peed. Why? Because the, du the duration of time from when they pee to when you got home is of course longer than them interacting with you and coming home after they put the key in the door. And so what's gonna happen is as soon as you come home, that dog is so scared, it's a little puppy, it's gonna pee right away. <laughs> anyway, so make sure that the timing is critical. You know, what you do is if you want extinction, if you want the you know, dog to stop, you gotta catch him in the act. Uh, choose the simplest and most effective schedule of reinforcement, again, based on the company. Uh, goal setting theory relates to the basic model, the desire to meet a goal prompts effort. So you've got your goal and that goal is gonna lead to effort. I'm thinking about you guys. You know, um, I, I've talked to many of you about, about your goals in this class, uh, you know, Jasmine, uh, Joey, um, Mercedes, Amaru, I mean, I've got Joseph, I've got Grace, so many of you, and I know many of you are from other classes, you know, Paris, uh, Gary. Uh, and what's been really, really gratifying, by the way, if I didn't call your name, it's because, you know, it's still early for me and I've got, uh, I'm already not good with names. Um, Tanya. Um, I'm, I'm rooting for you guys. I just want you to know I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm rooting for you to continue being successful, uh, to get your education out of the way. And by the way, that's kind of a misnomer because of course education never ends, right? 
but to get your, your, your college education out of the way and to keep taking it in, to keep learning and keep moving forward and keep growing. And hopefully all of that will help you position for that great, you know, great company, whatever it is that your goal is. Having uh, been doing this for now, uh, well, 24 years, counting Cal Poly, um, it's so gratifying for me to hear back from former students, uh, usually through LinkedIn, and uh, connecting with them and, 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 and discovering, wow, they, they got their MBA a while ago, and they're out there now, they're CEO, they're CFO, they're CIO. It's been long enough since I've taught that I get to hear back, and it's really gratifying because sometimes I can, I remember conversations we're having and how we tweak the ed plan and it's gratifying and so i for, i know that if you're watching this you know in terms of effort and in terms of motivation you're still you're still here right this is the last lecture of the semester we've gone through a lot this is an historic semester and you're still here until the very last um lecture and i, I want you to just pause and you know reward yourself because you have endured, uh, continue that, right? Continue to follow your ad plan, continue to grow. Learning never ends. So whatever your goal is, I know that you guys have done that. Your initiation, the direction, the persistence. This is an example of persistence. The direction is what you're gonna take next semester. For those of you who haven't taken business 10, I'm teaching it in the summer. If you're in my class, I always give you an ad code. Um, and then, of course, that leads to performance, right? So the idea being that for that final exam of ours, which is 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, that you guys will crush it. By now, you know how to do this thing, flashcard, etc. cetera. Uh, the goal setting theory, right? So we'll clarify the goal uh, in terms of goal specificity. Uh, the difficulty, this should be challenging. Uh, it goes back to flow, the whole thing of flow. Goal acceptance, that this should be agreed and understood. Uh, sometimes, you know, upper management will just kind of like dictate what the goals are and the employees are like, what? And if you think about that at work, maybe it's happened to you where you've had uh, your boss say, there's a new way of doing things or we have changed this and everybody's looking at each other going, what? And then a month or two later, they go like, oh, we go back to the old way for now. Um, and that's maybe because the goals were not agreed or understood. And of course, performance feedback, right? Information on goal progress. Um, the goal, the setting goal, you know, JetBlue is an interesting company. I'm sure you've heard of them, but JetBlue, that, that guy here, he was an executive at Southwest Airline. He left Southwest Airline. He had a non-compete agreement. I think it was 10 years. And he basically took the time to create JetBlue. He thought what all the stuff that I learned from Southwest, the ideas that they didn't want to take from me that I thought were great ideas, I'm going to use them to create my own company, JetBlue. Uh, and JetBlue um, has really just been an interesting company to follow. Uh, by the way, after this whole pandemic, a lot of these companies are not going to be around. Airlines are going to be reshuffled. And so uh, 20 minutes, right, from plane hold to baggage claim in 20 minutes, which I guess is uh, in, in the industry, it's the most aggressive goal that, that they have. Uh, so how do you add the goal setting theory to the model? There it is. Uh, you, know, you, you add it to, the, to your, the tension, energized to take action, and the effort. And if you think about how many students decide to go to community college, uh, and some of them to like, you know, that's it. You know, I've, I've worked, I, maybe I got a high school diploma, maybe I didn't get an education. I've worked for this company, I worked my way up. And uh, now I, uh, I want to go to the next level. And for that, I need formal higher education. And I need knowledge, more importantly than the piece of paper, knowledge. The piece of paper is not enough. The piece of paper will backfire one day if that's all you care about, just so you guys know. Your education means you having learned. Your education means you being able to um, execute something and put it together because of the knowledge you've acquired. Uh, education is not just you having a piece of paper and getting a job. Uh, unfortunately, if that's all you care about, you're gonna get found out and you're not gonna last. Uh, let's see, uh, effort is, again, is the goal is gonna affect the effort. Motivating with goal theory setting, assign specific challenging goals, make sure the workers accept, provide frequent specific performance feedback. Uh, in terms of the integrated model, when you talk about motivating, 
uh, all of the things we talked about, they should be part of that formula, right? Everything here. So you, yes, what do we do with the basics? Got it. And then you add to that expectancy theory, goal setting, equity, reinforcement. All these things should go together. Um, if you think about the previous chapter, the reason these two chapters here are hand in hand, human resource management, remember HRIS, human resources information system, a lot of the sophisticated HRIS system have actually taken these factors of motivation and built them in to the HRIS. Um, and then over here, um, this is great because what it does is kind of like ties everything with a knot for us in terms of what the manager should do to motivate with each of these, right? So for the basics, first thing you do, ask people what their needs are. First thing you do, what, why are you in this class? I know I have a tendency, you know, maybe, uh, you know, we talked about this in class, right, Tanya, where um, I know one time I asked everybody, how many of you are planning on transferring? And Tanya, you did raise your hand. And I said, no, no, you have to transfer. And that's my, that's my mistake because I want everybody to get a college degree. Uh, but that's not true, right? Not everybody, Tanya, I know you're a professional and a lot of, uh, a lot of students are just here just for the knowledge and they're gonna move on with their profession. Um, and so I need to remember that I need to support everybody in the class based on what your needs are. I still deep inside believe I want all of you to get your bachelor's degree at the very least. And I especially want you to get your master's degree um, because again, the, the master's degree is two years, not four years and there's no more general uh, ed class, and you apply all the knowledge that you have acquired in industry, it's just a really interesting, dynamic, fun degree. AACSB. Please, everybody, if you've learned anything in my Business 10 class, AACSB accredited business program. Really important. Uh, if you go to a non-accredited program, I don't know what you're gonna be learning, but some of them are just handing degrees out with nothing. So uh, very important that you get the knowledge. Um, if, you, uh, if you get a business degree and there's no accounting, there's no finance, and they're not even requiring you to take the GMAT, which is the, uh, the exam that you have to take to go to grad school for the, uh, for the MBA. If you're about to go to a school that has a business master's degree and don't require you to take the GMAT, that's a problem. So again, just make sure we talked about this. You guys walk out with knowledge. Uh, you know, again, get all of the lower uh, order needs first. So if I'm trying to manage my people, but I don't have dental, I don't have vision, uh, that's expensive. I don't know if you guys, any of you wear glasses, but by the time you're done, 600 bucks, 500 bucks, easy for a pair of glasses, right? If you don't have vision, that's a lot of money for people. Expect people's needs to change, you know, Everything changes when you get kids, that's it. Uh, and uh, you know, so that's for the basics. Equity theory, look for and correct the major inequities. We talked about that, reduce empl employees input, make sure decision-making process is fair. So that's, those are some of the ways you can reduce uh, in terms of the, the uh, get equity going. Expectancy, gather information to find out what they want from their job, right? Sometimes, uh, you know, people, um, think they know what their employees want. They don't ask. And then later on, you find out, what? I, that's not at all what I thought you guys wanted. It's a really smart idea to ask your people. Um, I'm very lucky because my current dean uh, is a kind of guy who really just supports us in every way we want. And sometimes we'll get an email like, are you guys interested in this? You know, uh, he, He's been really, really great at you know connecting with us to help us with the expectancy theory here. Uh, let's see, take specific steps to link rewards to individual performance in a way that is clear and understandable. Uh, the reinforcement theory, again, uh, identify, measure, intervene uh, to evaluate critical performance related behavior and do not reinforce the wrong behavior. Uh, if there's one lesson I can give you about human resources and wrong behavior, it's that, um, you know, good intentions don't work. I know it sounds weird, right? But if you decided that, okay, you have a new employee and um, you don't want to be too hard on them. And so you want to not write him up. You want to give him a chance. 
that that's a mistake. You're not going to be mean. People need to know how they're doing. But the problem is that you're creating this false expectation when you're not telling them the truth about their performance and they think they've been doing great. And then one day when you tell them you're actually quite horrible, they think, well, no, why, why are you saying this? Clearly, you must not like me. And so it's critical that you give people the proper feedback. Uh, and so that, that way the reinforcement therapy, uh, reinfor reinforcement theory will work. And if it doesn't work, you will need therapy. Uh, don't reinforce the wrong behavior correct and miss the punishment at appropriate time. We talked about that. And for the goal setting, again, make sure that the goals are specific and challenging. You probably remember all the SMART goals we talked about. Provide, uh, make sure workers truly accept the goals. And this is where we talked about uh, Henry uh, Winterkorn. Do you guys remember him? He was the guy who ran Audi before he was a CEO of Volkswagen. Uh, and he was an interesting guy because he really, he's the one who transformed Audi. If Audi is way, way, way up there today in terms of uh, uh, quality, reliability, sales, et cetera, et cetera, it's because of Henry Winterkorn, but because of the goal setting theory that he had at Audi, they transformed everything. And we talked about him before. Uh, and then you can pr uh, provide frequent specific performance related feedback. Well, that's it for this lecture. Um, I hope uh, that um, you know you got a lot out of it. I really hope that you got a lot out of the class. I really enjoyed your class very much. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't get to cover all the chapters. I was actually really looking forward to covering the last chapter uh, with you, uh, talk about Deming. But uh, we, of course, with all the pandemic and everything, we didn't have the time. I wish you continued success. I know I'm gonna see some of you uh, in fall, I know some of you already indicated you're going to take my global business class. Um, I'll be teaching uh, global business, business 61 in fall. I'll be teaching this class, intro to management, and several business 10 classes. But I think that's it for that. And for those of you who are also interested in global business, I'll be teaching um, international marketing in spring of next year. And then I've got the two business 10 classes this summer. So again, I know I'll be seeing some of you again. Uh, I wish you all the best. Um, this has been a great class. And um, for those of you who are graduating, congratulations.